Now, the four books of Confucian learning is one of uh, the five modules of the BA Sonology Humanistic Education. You might be wondering, what are the four books of Confucian learning? They happen to be the four core texts made up the curriculum for, from part of the curriculum for the formal uh, learning for scholars in the last 600 years of China's imperial history. Wise learning, sometimes translated as the great learning, the practice of the mean, the Analects of Confucius, and the Mencius. Now, this module uh, will be co-taught by Dr. Catherine No and myself. And I suppose in many respects, um, the highest learning is considered to be the first among the four texts. Um, it is the shortest of the four. It comes to comprises just over 2,200 Chinese characters. But despite its brevity, it's also one of the most studied writings in pre-modern Chinese scholarship. Now, here we have four English translations of the four books of Confucian learning. Now, for this sample lecture, we'll focus on explicating the passage from the sort of the latter part of the highest learning. And um, we'll sort of temporarily set aside issues of uh, textual issues like authorship, dating, different editions. Um, I'll look at um, what the what it means from the wording of the text, and Catherine will take us through the broader ethical philosophy. We'll be looking at the English translation based on um, the work of Ian Johnston and Wang Ping, uh, with some modifications, and we'll be using the commentaries by Zheng Xuan, as well as which was further explained by the 7th century scholar Kong Da. These two commentaries formed part of the standard edition of the 13 classics. This is the extract from The Highest Learning. It's really long and we'll take it you know, in, in pieces. So what is meant by saying to bring good order to a state, it is first necessary to regulate one's household is this, nobody can teach others if they cannot teach their own household. What does this mean? Well, first, uh, given that the highest learning is a text that's been dated to around the 5th to the 3rd century before the Common Era, um, this is pre-imperial times. So a state uh, referred to a feudal domain that acknowledged allegiance to the dynastic ruler. And this was being the times of the Zhou dynasty. The dynastic ruler would be the ruler of the Zhou, the state of Zhou, which we can see here. Now, to bring good order to a state, it's first necessary to regulate one's household. Now, when we talk about household or family, we might immediately think about the nuclear family. Um, but Family, or the household in those days, um, refer to a person's extended family, what's known as the family clan. And this might be uh, involve up to um, perhaps 100 members, 100 relatives, if not more. Um, they sort of would come to equate with sort of our modern medium to large organisations. And I say this because <clears throat> these Family clans had shared estates, um, shared assets. For example, the ancestral hall where the ancestral remembrance ceremonies would be held to commemorate the family's ancestors. So the by family household, we're talking about the extended family in terms of the family clans in those days. Now, regulating the household, you know, to bring good order to a state, it is first necessary to regulate household, this idea of regulate. Um, the Chinese character for regulate originally meant um, even or orderly. And if you can see here on the right, it was based on um, sort of, this is the ancient form uh, of the character, what's known as the oracle bone script. 
and it's meant to depict um, sort of stalks of wheat. Now, even though we can see that they're, you know they're not quite even um, in, in the, the old character, um, but that's because um, of the undulating sort of level of the ground, the field. Um, the weed stalks themselves are known to grow to approximately the same height, and that's why they're used to convey the idea of even and orderliness. Um, as a verb, it would mean to make equal or equitable. Now, what does it mean to regulate the household then? Um, it doesn't mean having a management structure in place or having a lot of rules. Um, if you can imagine in any family, you know, the different members uh, will have different roles and responsibilities. Everyone has different talents and strengths. Um, but it, although everyone has maybe a different part to play, a uh, different contribution, everyone is able to uh, get along and love and respect each other and live and work together harmoniously. And this is the idea. Uh, regulate is ensuring that there is a harmonious um, harmony within the family. Now, we look back to the passage. What is meant by saying to bring good order to a state? It is first necessary to regulate one's household as this. Nobody can teach others if they cannot teach your own household. And here, um, the family household, this extended family of the family clan, is linked to the state. Now, to understand how that works, um, the key word is teach um, or educate. Now, this idea of teach or educate is not necessarily limited to you know, formal schooling. It um, refers to a more broader concept of education or instruction, and in that one that's centered on family education. How each family member conducts themselves it sets a very powerful example for the next generations. So um, when we look at the sort of earliest dictionary definition of this particular character, um, which we find in the Shawinzi Dictionary, states, whatever the leader does, the subordinate follows. So learning through emulation and the positive role models around us. So the idea is that those family elders, those more senior, would provide a positive role model, set of positive, the right examples for uh, the younger, more junior members of the family. Um, we teach others not just through formal lectures, um, but through our interpersonal interactions. As they say, actions speak louder than words. Now, the idea that nobody can teach others if they cannot teach their own household. Now, what is that all about? Um, if those more senior in the family, my household, like the family elders, the parents, the older siblings, they're not able to provide that positive role model, positive examples for uh, the more junior members of the family, uh, then the highest learning tells us in no uncertain terms that it is impossible for them to educate others. But you know, we might be wondering, how is this the case? You know, many people, they might not be exemplars at home, but um, they can still be professional teachers, teach geography, maths, science, etc. Well, um, the idea of education or teaching here is quite different from subject-specific uh, teaching. It involves a humanistic education. Now, Confucian thought is often described as humanistic because it's about how we relate to others. At the end of the day, no one, no human being is an island. You know, when we are born, we have parents and maybe even siblings. And when we grow up, we have friends and neighbours, classmates and colleagues. The idea here is how do we get along with others? Um, how do we make the most of these interactions and relationships so that we all mutually benefit? Um, this is the type of education that is here encapsulated in the character for teach or educate. Um, so it makes sense that if a person doesn't get along with their family members, 
um, well, it would be very difficult for them to help or guide others to, to do the same. Um, so notice that the highest learning here is quite definite. Um, if a person cannot help others in their own home, you know, sort of teach others in their own home, then it is impossible for them to educate others and anyone beyond the home. Now, it goes on to say, therefore, the noble person does not go beyond their household. They don't need to leave their home to have a transformative effect on the state. How does this work? What is this noble person? Well, there are two interpretations. A uh, person of noble birth, so someone who was born into the nobility, they would inherit a title um, that would you know, provide, um, that would mean they would be able to serve in a leadership role or position, and um, their upbringing would sort of ensure that they would develop um, themselves to be able to serve or be fit for that leadership role. Um, that's someone who is born into the nobility, a person of noble birth. The noble person can also mean a person of noble character. Now, obviously, the two are not mutually exclusive, but the person of noble character is not necessarily born into um, the noble classes. They, uh, but they have cultivated such that um, they conform to this ideal of uh, a person of noble birth. In the Confucian context, the noble person, you might have heard of the Chinese Junzu, um, refers to someone who has cultivated themselves, their ethical character, to such a standard. Now, what it's saying here, you know, how does it work? How does the noble person you know, not need, need to leave the house to achieve this transformative effect on the state? Well, saying that person who is filial is thus able to serve the ruler. Person who is reverent to their family um, means someone who is mindful of the compassion and loving kindness of their, you know, starting with their parents. Family reverence is obviously much broader than uh, reciprocating the loving kindness of our parents, but that is where it starts. And that is because our parents have nurtured our um, physical, cognitive, social, emotional, and moral uh, development from the very moment that we were born. And so it is in being mindful of their loving kindness that um, we are able to naturally be able to reciprocate um, their, their love for us. And it means much more than just giving financial support. Now notice that um, family reverence is certainly not about being blindly obedient. If our parents ask us to do something and it is in any way harmful or detrimental to them or us or anyone else, the environment, then the filial son or daughter would, um, you know, propose a better way of doing that. So it is certainly not blind obedience. Now, the idea here is a person who is filial to their um, parents, the family elders, um, would be able to serve their ruler because um, the leaders of the family, um, attending to the leaders of the family, require is tran the, the skills translate to attending to the matters and the uh, needs of the people beyond um, in the leaders of the organisations, like our workplace. Um, we'll know how to be able to listen carefully, to understand the needs of others, to um, attend to, you know, do the best in our work duties um, and give feedback um, as necessary. Now, that, this is about someone who is filial to their parents and family. The next is about a person who has fraternal respect. They are, they have this deference towards their uh, elder siblings within the family. And it's the character um, traditionally is written in this form. Um, it's meant to depict the, the, I suppose, the rounds in a quarter rope when it's tied together, these natural loops. Um, 
meant to convey the natural birth order in a family. You know, when we born um, into a family, there's a natural birth order. The world doesn't revolve around us. We might have older siblings to um, respect and learn from and younger siblings to look after and care for. And so um, by doing so, we naturally develop this fraternal respect, more deference um, to be able to work with and respect others, whether that's at school, university, work, or in the community. And by the same token, not to neglect um, those who are more junior, more younger, more less knowledgeable, less experienced, etc. So in other words, we know how to work well with our peers and colleagues. Then the highest learning tells us one who is someone who is compassionate um, is able to employ or engage, govern the multitude, the people. Now, this is about the parental role. Parents manifest a natural compassion for their, their children, for the family as a whole. And certainly in allocating the resources of the family, they're always mindful of the needs and interests of their children. And this natural consideration of those in our care is certainly necessary for uh, anyone managing personnel. The highest learning here is advocating um, this compassion um, being the guiding principle in governing the people. Now, regardless of what position we find ourselves, uh, whether as leaders or team members working in a team, um, all of these roles in the community are natural extensions of um, how a person relates to their family um, members at home. Now, the passage goes on to quote from the venerate, venerated documents. And this is one of the five classics of Confucian learning. It records the political communications and events of the earliest periods of China's history. And in this chapter, uh, called The Announcement to Come, it refers to the Duke of Zhou, one of the people, historical figures that Confucius most admired. Um, he was also one of the founding fathers of the Zhou dynasty. He acted as regent um, for his nephew, um, King Cheng. And at this point in time, he'd just sort of successfully resolved an insurgence. Um, and this was led by his brothers. And the former prince of the Shang dynasty, the previous dynasty. Um, and so the relevant territory um, it, he entrusts to the care of his younger brother, Kang Shu, and that's the Kang in, in the chapter title. Um, and he advises or guides his brother, as you can imagine, this territory could become politically volatile. But he, in the following words, he, he's guiding his brother on how to care for the people in this territory, how to look after this territory properly. Um, and he uses the analogy of a newborn child. In Chinese, it's chi um, um, which literally translates to a red child. And Kong Da explains that this is because of the flushed appearance of newborn infants, they're rather pink. Um, and this, through this analogy, there's two, two significant points. One is that, um, it in, sort of guides his brother to look upon the people in this territory as a member of his own family and also the most vulnerable member of the family. So as you can imagine, newborn children, they're completely helpless. So clearly the people in this territory need a holistic nurturing and care. Um, but, you know, it might be a bit difficult for us to get our heads around, you know, how do we see these strangers as family members? Well, the next part of this passage um, provides the key. If you uh, sincerely seek to do something, uh, even if you do not hit the mark, you will not be far off. Um, and George Shen explains that, you know, in raising children. Um, empathy is a key to understanding the needs and wants of the infant. Of course, you know, newborn children cannot talk um, yet. And so you really need to use your empathy skills. And 
Kongida further explains that in loving the newborn infant, you know, you'll have a pure and sincere mind uh, focused on trying to understand what it is um, they're crying for. Um, although a person may not be completely accurate, their best guess will not be far off. As they say, where there's a will, there is a way. And so um, this idea here is that when a leader sincerely wants to care for uh, the people of this territory, his subjects, his subordinates, um, by doing their utmost, you know, they won't be far off the mark. It's a very encouraging uh, piece of advice. And I hope you can see that from this simple explication, we start to understand that achieving harmony within the family is a key and the precondition to successful leadership and management um, beyond the home. Now, this concept within the highest learning, um, how does this relate to Confucian learning as a whole? Well, I'd like to hand over to Catherine now to take us through the broader ethical philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, and with all of these pre-modern texts, um, it's imperative that we begin with a very um, sort of microscopic, um, close reading, looking at individual um, words and what they meant in the historical context. But then um, the next step is to zoom out and look at it from the point of view of, well, what now? What about these concepts? How can they be um, applied to our lives, um, to modern life even? And I guess the entire passage here talks about the relationship between the family and the state. And I want to sort of challenge this by saying, well, so what? But like, why should we bother with this question about family and the state? Because many people these days don't feel that uh, politics or even political administration is very relevant to their lives, to their daily lives at least. And I guess rather than thinking about just the sort of family and the state sort of relation, what this text is actually getting at is the public and private divide in our lives. So I'd like to share with you the words from an American psychologist, Philip Ivanhoe, in California. And he talks about how there's this very influential view in Western political philosophy and culture that sees the public and the private sides of ourselves as quite separate. So what happens at home and what happens outside the home seem to be different and therefore leads to different modes of living. So he says here, well, you know, for at home, um, we think of it as a place of shared love, this generosity, this warmth, and, you know, generally we don't use the letter of the law within the family. Um, obviously, this would be the case if there was in an exemplary sort of environment of harmonious interactions between the members of the ideal family. Now, in contrast, in the public sphere you know, outside the home is it's seen as a jungle out there and it's characterised by aggression, competition, greed, hostility, etc. And that's where... Um, we are thought to need principles like fairness and virtues like justice in order to prevent it from descending into chaos. Now, Confucians argued that what we do in the private realm of our life is very much connected with what happens outside of the home. So they say that, in fact, um, the public and the private, the home and the outside the home aspects of our life are mutually influential. And in fact, family life is fundamental um, to the community life, and our, our work life, you would say. Um, so the two parts, public and private, are really two parts of the same one whole. So we see this actually in many biographies of renowned uh, statesmen and officials um, throughout Chinese history in the historical records. So I'd like to share with you sort of three cases um, today, given the time, um, and to really highlight the virtues or those ideas that we um, encountered in this particular passage. So family reverence, fraternal respect, and compassion. The first person I'd like to introduce you to is Huang Tingjian, who um, lived in the uh, 11th century, 
Um, but basically, he, he's very well known as a statesman, but also as a calligrapher, as you can see here, um, painter, poet, um, but also very famous as a exemplar of family reverence. Um, in the historical records, um, we're told that his mother was severely debilitated throughout the year. And as depicted in this picture, he would personally take care of her. There's a story about how he personally um, cleans the chamber pot for his mother. And you can imagine that this, you know, the challenge of being a personal carer, on top of the challenges of his career, um, was something um, that he, um, he had to encounter, but also um, shows the depth of his commitment to his mother and this idea of family reverence. But then this also translates to a commitment for his ruler, for uh, the state. So we know that in his political career, he was um, in fact demoted and exiled several times um, because of his voicing um, unpopular opinions, but uh, opinions that he felt were necessary for the benefit of the state. So you can see that this idea of commitment at home then translates to this commitment outside of the home towards the state and towards his ruler. So that's the idea of family reverence. Then um, Li Zi was a very famous military general, um, distinguished military general and statesman of the Tang dynasty. He's recorded um, in the historical records here um, as having a harmonious household. And during his old age, in fact, we read that he personally um, cooked the porridge or the congee for his elderly sister um, when she was ill. Uh, in those days, cooking was actually over an open fire. And what happened was that because of a sudden gust of wind, his beard was singed. You see the beard in this portrait. And his sister was quite concerned at the sight of um, his injury and said, you know, we have so many servants and maids, you don't really have to do this yourself. And he replies, well, you're getting old and I am too. And there's really, how many more times can I cook for you? And so you can see that this it was this genuine care and concern and love that he had for his siblings. And this then translates into excellent collaborative skills, collaborative skills as a team player. So it's recorded um, in the text that he would discuss issues with his troops. So he was the general, but he'd still discuss issues with his troops and be very willing to accept their suggestions. He credited his subordinates um, whenever they had victory, um, achieved victory, and shared his awards of gold and silver with them. And so the NC that cherishing the bond with his siblings um, was extended to then being able to achieve that um, respect and um, camaraderie within his troops. And that's that idea and that virtue of fraternal respect that we heard about before. And finally, um, the very famous historian Sima Huang um, of the 11th century was uh, known for his magnum opus, the Comprehensive Mirror for Aid in Government, but also um, he compiled another text called the Models for the Family. So you can see that this text was for his children, for his descendants, and was really um, focused on the idea of uh, family practices, family education. They can see the, the twin concerns, so a concern for the state, but also a concern for the family. Um, and he felt that this was equally important. Um, it's in this um, Models for the Family, which I've highlighted here in red, he includes the very passage that we just read in the highest learning. We know, of course, that Sima Huang was able to actually live out these virtues in his life. Um, many, many stories of his life, um, just one with uh, that I want to share with you, his father, Sima Dan. Um, when he was very elderly, Sima Huang would look after him as if a father and really attend to the personal detail, the very fine details of his care. And he was highly regarded in the community in his work as a statesman, so much so that he was 
uh, considered a living Buddha. So you can see that, you know, just through these few records, that the family values that we talked about um, in this passage were considered important for the professional life and the idea of outside the family, um, as it says here, the state. Because from the Confucian perspective, the family was considered a paradigm of the state. And from a practical level, the virtues, the skills that we develop within the family are um, ever relevant to our relationships outside in the community, in our work. And so this very, and that hopefully helps you better understand this very central concept in the highest learning that to bring good order to a state, it is first necessary to regulate one's household. Thank you very much.